you will, turn back in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 21, as we continue our observation of the language there that John is describing for us, language that really only matters to a person who has an interest in eternity. Our title today is The New Jerusalem, Our God is the True Light. Our God is the True Light. That's exactly what John wants us to focus in on. Think about that thought for a moment. Our God is the true light. Now, we left off last time having had our attention drawn by the apostle to the absence of the temple. If you recall, over in chapter 21, verse 22, he says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple thereof. Now, one of the things I shared with you about the book of the Revelation is the things that are in that book. You definitely want to pay attention to them. They are salient symbols and typological patterns of eternal realities. But also, whenever someone is painting a picture or giving you an optic, you also want to recognize what's not there. So in the 21st chapter, what John is doing, and you guys remember, we are over into eternity now. So you have to span the tension between the fact that we live in time, but are being called right now to contemplate eternity. And that tension can be difficult for you. But if you're a child of God, you are a child of eternity. You don't exist for merely time. You exist for eternity. And the God who made you and I, who is called the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, he himself is eternal in nature. So the vision you and I are contemplating now is a vision that corresponds to where we are in God's view of things, if in fact we are children of God. Um, uh, Lo, Lo, can you or one of you guys uh, make sure the uh, AC is around 69 because these sisters, they fanning real hard right about now. We don't want nobody, want nobody passing out. Um, and uh, when we, when we, I, I want us to understand the tension here because what you'll do if you get caught up in the language without your optic being broad enough is you will fail to see what John is saying. Last week, we discovered that John told us in glory, there will be no physical temple. There will be no material edifice. There will be no, um, no structure by which the people of God in a catechismal way are brought to God. You guys have learned with me as we vividly laid out, what is the purpose of a tabernacle or a temple as it has spanned history? It has always been that institution or that edifice by which men and women could draw near to God. Whenever you come to a temple or a tabernacle or a synagogue ecclesia where there is ritualism and symbolism and typology, uh, what you are doing is being catechized. We could even say that now, that when you come into the church of the living God, your agency, your humanity, your person conforms to the arena. The church is the arena. You sit down and you posture yourself as one that's ready to learn from God. So at that point, you are temporarily taking on what is called discipleship. And then you're being educated by the whole environment as to what this environment signifies and represents. And the church of the living God signifies and represents what God has done for us in Christ to prepare us now for eternity. And I've shared with you before that if you're a child of the living God and you have the spirit of God, you are capable of understanding eternal matters even though you are walking in the dimension of time. If you had no interest in Christ, the things that you heard our elder read would make no sense to you. But we will seek to try to make a little sense out of this language because you and I need to know how God operates in leading us to the place that we are already at. Remember that language? I am going to a place where I already am. Right. I know, again, that's bad grammar, but it's true. The child of the living God is already seated in heavenly places in Christ, is he not? The child of the living God is already beholding the face of his God, is he not? The child of God who is on his way to glory is in glory right now. And one of the more tangible ways we can know it is that when we open our Bibles and our hearts are attentive, 
God shows us who we are in him and where we are in him if we are interested in it. Now, as I stated, what we're dealing with here now, John is telling us, notice that there is no temple there. We're done with the work of catechism. We're done with being drawn to the one door that lets us into the tabernacle. Who is that door? Jesus. We're done with coming on the inside of that tabernacle and looking to the left and seeing an altar for burnt sacrifice. Who is our sacrifice? You're going to keep getting it right all the way up to the Holy of Holies. You're going to keep getting it right. We look over to the left and we see a labor for washing. Who is our sanctification and cleansing? And then we keep heading to the holy place. And as we head there, we find an altar of incense. Who is the one mediator between man and God? What's his name? All right, y'all still getting an A. And as we head into the holy place where the Shekinah glory is manifested on the menorah that points down on the showbread, who is the bread of life? Who is the light of the world? And the high priest who is representing you is actually moving closer to God. This is the study we are learning in Tuesday and Friday. Draw nigh to God. That's what he does with a sinner when he redeems him. He gradually moves us closer to God. We're only moving closer to God because we are in our high priest. Who is the one that entered into the Holy of Holies one time? Jesus. Who is the one who's by his sacrifice once for all offered up to God, perfected everyone who is sanctified in him? What's his name? Jesus. And you, what, you are, what you are realizing now in Revelation 21 is all of that work is done. There's no temple. We don't have to go through that anymore. And, and quite frankly, Paul echoed it in, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, around verse 12, when he said, uh, we know in part and we prophesy in part right now. But there's a day coming when we will know completely, even as we're known. And watch this. Prophecy will be over with. Teaching will be over with. Catechism of, of biblical instruction will be over with. A lot of the tutorial stuff we go through now will be over with because we will be fully grown. See, when you're a child, you have to be educated. And right now we're children of God, are we not? So we're often in this catechismal process, this mode of being educated. But in glory, that's all over with. Now, that struck me interesting this morning about four o'clock when I got up and started studying. Because, you know, I'm really curious about things that are said and their implications are their consequential fallout. What are we going to be doing in glory when we will no longer need a Bible? What will we be doing in glory when we will no longer need the catechismal structure of an edifice and go through the uh, what we would call the sacer sacerdotal structure of scripture reading and prayer and catechism and all of that? What will we be doing? This is exactly what you need to think through now, because you've been told this. It just hasn't come home yet. What you will be doing is being what you were made to be. That's what you will be doing. We're being trained to that now. In that day, you will be doing what you were made to be without any of the external props. Did y'all get that? One day, it'll just be you and God fellowshipping in the fullness of all he is and in the fullness of all you are in him. And we will be worshiping God unmediated, without tools, without instruments, without aids and without props. It'll be just natural to our being. In that day, we'll be fellowshipping with God without all of these externalities. You notice what's missing in that book? All of the stuff that we are doing now. No temple. That's amazing. That means you don't say, hey, man, I'm going down to Grace Bible Church in Hayward. No, you're not. Not in glory, you're not. In glory, you're going to worship God 24 hours a day. And that, too, is oxymoronic, is it not? Because we will be outside of time. In glory, you will always be in a permanent close proximity to God. You will never struggle with being far away from God. In glory, you will never, ever need any kind of instrument or guidance. And I may say this even up front. It tells us there will be no sun and no moon and no stars. In glory, you won't need a guide. You won't need a pastor, teacher who expounds the word to help you see the glory of God. Because God himself will be all that for you. There will be a direct relationship between us and God that puts an end to all these things. Now, we need them now, do we not? Because we are in between what? Grace and glory. 
We are in between grace and glory. So we need these things now. But one day we won't need them at all. Is that amazing? So I, I'm sharing with you how that God has revealed to you and me that temple worship has been needed since the fall of man, has it not? Uh, the tabernacle was built in 1480 B.C. by Moses. And in 1480 B.C., that tabernacle represented the presence of God, did it not? The shine of, Shekinah glory was in it, and it was in the midst of Israel. And wherever Israel went, that Shekinah glory was there. But it was covered over by a tent, was it not? And that tent represented the fact that mankind did not, as of yet, have access to God because of his sin. God was close to him, but he wasn't in yet. The tabernacle taught us that. The tabernacle ended up being shredded in Shiloh, and God in his mercy raised up a temple under Solomon, did he not? This was 967 B.C. It was done in 960 B.C., and that temple was magnificent. One day we'll, we'll do a study on the Temple of Solomon, the parallelisms between it and the tabernacle and the big differences. For instance, the Holy of Holy is one of the three squares in the Bible. Have not I shared that with you? The Holy of Holies, the breastplate on the high priest, and then the altar, right? Those are all three squares. Well, the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle of Moses was 10 by 10 by 10. The Holy of Holies in Solomon's day was 15 by 15 by 15. What that means is Solomon's Holy of Holies expanded. It got larger. And here's the reason why. There were more people drawn to God from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. And thus the Holy of Holies had to have a greater glorious magnification. Am I making some sense? That's exactly what that was. But one day that tabernacle or temple was destroyed. It was destroyed in 587 BC, wasn't it? By, uh, by Nebuchadnezzar. But then it was rebuilt again in around 445 B.C. under Ezra and, and Nehemiah and Xerxes and Artaxerxes. And then it was destroyed again around 300 B.C. under Alexander the Great and Antiochus Epiphanes, only to be rebuilt again right before Jesus was born under Herod in the days of the Herodian temple, of which, remember, Christ told the disciples, hey, guess what, fellas, this temple coming down one more time. So I know you're a little bit dizzy because you do know the history. Temple up, temple down. Temple up, temple down. Temple up, temple down. Because the temple pointed us to the incarnation, the death, burial, and what? Resurrection of Jesus Christ. And this is where Jesus said in John chapter 2, verse 19, destroy this temple. And he wasn't talking about a physical temple then. He was talking about the temple of what? His body. And I will raise it up on the what? On the third day. Jesus rose again on the third day as the temple of the living God, did he not? The temple that you see in the book of Revelation is described by John as the Lamb of God. Guess what that means? That even as Jesus is the final embodiment of all that the temple signify, every believer in Christ is a part of that temple, are we not? You are the temple of the living God. Please hear me now, because I want you to get this. When you're reading the book of Revelation, you are reading a narrative of two tales. The tale of time and the tale of eternity. The tale of time is telling, that you, telling you and me that we have been brought into a mystery of which we are part of. Can you get this, that you are the temple of the living God? Can you get the idea that God dwells with you and you dwell with him and you are now qualified to tell men and women who the true and living and triune God is? And right where you are and right where they are, they can come to a saving knowledge of Christ. They can see his redeeming glory. They can enter into worship right there because where two or three are gathered in his name who know the true and the living God, you are a mobile temple. What am I saying? I'm saying what you're reading in the revelation about eternity starts now. You got to get that, saints. That's why I helped you tie Revelation 21 with Isaiah chapter 60. Because Isaiah 60 is talking about a millennial kingdom, but John is taking it over into eternity. And we need to understand that tension, don't we? Well, I just shared it with you. If you're in Jesus Christ, you're tied between time and eternity. You are a millennial child. That means a whole lot. 
That means everything that you're seeing in Revelation chapter 21 has already begun in your own life. You are a partaker of God's eternal glory in Christ. And what we are reading is really talking about where we are now only to be consummated one day. Does that make some sense, you guys? Please understand that. That's what John wants you to get. Hey, no temple there. For God and the Lamb are the temple thereof. Well, we know that because Christ is our center point of glory even now, is he not? He's the center point of our redemptive glory. We contemplate God through Christ right now, one day, ultimately in a full sense. So John tells us in verse 22, I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple thereof. And I want to just tag that for, so, so we can move into our next point. When we talk about the temple, what we're talking about is God's redemptive glory. Anybody that really wants to be educated, capture that adjective and then capture the noun. Redemptive glory. God is glorious in the totality of his being, but he has revealed himself to us in a way of redemption in the person of Jesus. That's what we call his redeeming glory. Now, what is that redeeming glory designed to do? Draw hell-bound sinners into a relationship with God by the reconciling work of Christ on the cross. Please hear me now. Any other aspect of God's glory will kill you. Any other aspect of God's glory will kill you. It is the redeeming glory of God that allows the sinner to comprehend God's presence, his person, and reality because that, that glory is filtered through the person of Christ. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? Now, what John wants to share with you now is another aspect of his glory, and I want to share it with you too, which I think is absolutely fascinating, for which we have our title. The New Jerusalem is the place where our God is what? The true light. Verse 23. Here's what John said. There's some other things that are not there. The city had no need of the what? Neither of the moon to shine in it. Isn't that amazing? Now you could get stuck on temporal things if you wanted to. But I would recommend you move on. Because I think once we get into glory, we don't have to worry about how this world is going to function without a sun and a moon. Now what God is about to explain to you are other things in relationship to it. So we go on. It says, for the glory of God did what? Lighten it. And the lamb is the light thereof. Ah, there you go. Once again, the father and the son are combining efforts to make manifest to redeem people that they are their sufficiency. I want you to imagine this now as I give you a description of the light. I want you to imagine this. Imagine having that freedom to be in the presence of God without any kind of necessary mediation. And imagine you have somewhat of a grasp around the character of God as being this effulgent light that right now you and I could never look at. We could never see God in the effulgence of his brilliance and survive. We would be gone in a picosecond. Do you understand what God has to do for you, child of God, for you to be able to hang out with a God like that? He has to glorify you. And when once we are glorified, we'll be able to hang out with the God of glory unmitigated. Are y'all grasping what I'm saying? See, and this is why we believe in the doctrine of justification. Because justification leads to our sanctification. And sanctification is the beginning of our what? Glorification. We are already experiencing glory right now in the regeneration. This is why we can contemplate God and enjoy the contemplation. One day I look forward to God making me so compatible with himself, I can hang out with the ineffable bliss. Just hang out. And I want you to capture this because you can now. Just imagine a glory that is so blistering, it lights up the whole universe as God himself. And then he got a bunch of knuckleheads like us hanging out with him. Just hanging out with him. Because we have been made fit to be partakers of the saints in light. This is wild, isn't it? Did you know God created you with a mind to contemplate him like this? Did you know that? This is why for some of you right now, while it is kind of too hard to believe, at the same time, it's believable, isn't it? 
because you've been trained by the word of God to know that you're not like any other animal. You've been created in the Imago Dei. Your mind was made to think God's thoughts after him. Your mind was made to hear God's word and believe God's word. It was also made because you have the mind of Christ to rejoice in God revealing to you what you are in him so that you are being prepared for that very space. One day, one day, one day is what I say in our prayer service. One day, one day, one day, all this which is temporal will be brought into an eternal state and every son of glory, every daughter of glory will hang out with the God of glory, the Lord of glory, the spirit of glory, who for us right now is the king of glory. He is the true light that lights everyone that comes into the world. Has he lit you up yet? Can I get amen? Has he lit you up yet? See, because if he's lit you up, then you understand what I'm talking about. If he's lit you up, you've understand what I'm talking about. And this is a beautiful thing because he lit you up to put you on a pathway there. Right. So this is what I want you to capture with me as we work through only two major points. One is under our first point. God is light and Christ is his light. Now, that's not what we call in uh, in rhetoric a tautology. It's not saying the same thing twice. What God is in his primary personhood as the father is the imminent fullness of light. But what Christ is, is the filter by which that light allows human beings to be a partaker of it. He is equal with the father, but his function is one by which he becomes for us that light filter by which we can hang out with God. This is why your Bible clearly alludes to the father as always communicating through the son, the light of the knowledge of his glory to mankind. Hence, our first main point is God is light, but what? Christ is his light. This is Revelation 21, verse 23. But do you remember how uh, John put it in first in John chapter one? Would you start at verse five? John one, five. I could read verses one through uh, four, but I want you to hear John one, five through seven. And the light shineth in darkness. What is John talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He's talking about how Jesus came into the world and declared the father to humanity. And that darkness was you and me. There was a day when we didn't know God. Is that true? And then one day we came to know him, but we could only know him in his son. Jesus is the revelation of the invisible God, is he not? No man can see God at any time. Only he who is in the bosom of the father, he hath revealed him. So when men and women say, I know God, they can only know him through his son. His son is the light bearer of the reality of God and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. Watch this. Verse six. There was a man sent from God. His name was John. Now, who was John? Jesus cousin. Six months older than Jesus. He was the forerunner of Jesus, was he not? He was the one that said, prepare ye, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. That's John. That's his cousin. Notice what verse seven says. This same person came for a witness to bear witness of the what? We can translate that this same came for a witness to bear witness of who? Jesus. That all men through him, who is him? Jesus might what? So this is why the light is given. In order that you might believe God. So I want you to capture this as we work this through. Why is light given to men in misery? That's the way Job said it. Why is light given to men and women in darkness? In order that they might believe that you might believe the gospel. Now we know the light is a metaphor for knowledge. It's a metaphor for understanding. It's a metaphor for propositional truth. It's a metaphor for the unfolding of the revelation of God. The man or the woman who can comprehend the gospel has been brought into the light in a saving way. Verse eight, verse eight, John 1a. He was not that light. Who are we talking about now? John. But he was sent to bear witness of that light. Who is that light? Now, ladies and gentlemen, you and I are like John the Baptist. You know what our job is? Go tell men and women who the light is. And you can do that because the light is in you. You and you and I then, according to Jesus in Matthew chapter five, are called what? The light of the world. You see the correlation? I'm trying to bring you into tight proximity with time language that also corresponds with eternity. This is an amazing concept. 
And you need to get this because where we struggle in our life with a ton of issues is the way we think. Where we struggle, and every, it's not all about our thinking, but it is fundamentally about our thinking. And may I say this, if we are thinking wrong, we're headed in the wrong direction. You and I know that, and we have to adjust all the time, do we not? If we're humble, we make necessary adjustments if we find ourselves on the wrong road. And what God is here to help you and me do is think right. And if you want to have a life that brings glory to God, learn how to think God's thoughts after him. I say this all the time. You want to have elevated thoughts. You want to have thoughts that are transcendent. You want to have thoughts that are able to rise above all of the chatter of this world. Because this world is telling you all kind of stuff. And if you are stuck within the grid of this world chatter, you won't be able to make it out to properly understand the BS it's giving you. You got to be able to rise above this world, have a knowledge base that's able to look down with a bird's eye vision and see the landscape of the strategy of darkness coming after you. Am I making some sense? I have to be able to see what's going on in the world in order to navigate it. And that's what God does when he gives you a knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. He helps you see the world for what it really is. May I ask you not to do anything over the next 10 years? Do not close your eyes. Do not close your eyes. Because many people are. That will be the end of our message. Now let me go on because I want you to grasp something. So in our first main point, we have fundamentally said God is our light. Christ is our light. And what I am talking to you about now is what we call in our sub point, the light of the gospel. Listen to how Paul puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. And ask yourself, has this happened to you? Paul said in verse 4, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. Is he saying what John just said? Has shined where? In our hearts. See where the probing work of the Holy Ghost is? It's in your heart. It's not in your head. It's in your heart. Because your heart dictates what your head thinks. Whether you know it or not, I'm sorry, it's true. That's why salvation is from the heart. It's not from the head. With the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Why? Because the heart is the true nature of man. The head is where we reason, where we rational, rationalize, where we analyze. The heart is where all of the amens come in. When the heart says, this is what we're going to do, guess what? You're going to do that. That's why Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart doth the mouth speak. That's why he says, out of our heart are all kinds of evils. It's from the heart that we do what we do what we do. We need light on the heart. We'll be talking about that on Tuesday because you and I can be double-minded. Heck, we can be triple-minded. Can I get even a little bit more explicit? We can be quadruple-minded. We can be a multiple schizophrenic. Did you know that? Just get an honest person in the house because I do it from time to time. I do it on purpose. All right. So I'm simply saying this. You have to know that the seat of volition and choice making is really the heart. So often you will deceive yourself in thinking you're going to do something because you're operating from your intellect. But that intellect has not corresponded with your volition so that you engage that intellect to do it. This is why you end up not doing what you say you're going to do. And then doing what you say, I ain't going to do that. That's the thing you do. So why God must give light to your heart is so you can know him and you can know yourself. Isn't that what we learned on Saturday? So you can know him and know yourself. Saints, look, you can't know yourself without God. Too much darkness going on there. You need the Holy Ghost to help you figure you out. And that's why he brought you near to him so you can work on you. So you can see clearly, think clearly, feel clearly, and act clearly. Notice what he says. For God has commanded the light to shine out of your heart. It has shown in your heart to give you the light of the what? The knowledge of the glory of God. Where? In the face of Jesus Christ. Old Saxon language, which simply means God is a mystery, but he's made clear to us in the person of Christ. Face is person. Y'all got that? Not literal face, but in the manifestation of who Jesus is, we know God. Now, that's what the gospel does. Look at verse 7. 
Therefore, it says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels in order that the what? The excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Paul makes an implication that the knowledge of God that you have is not merely revelation to know him, but power to serve him. Remember what Paul said back in Romans chapter 116? I am not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's the what? Power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and then also to the Gentile. So when we're talking about a knowledge of God, God gives you revelation of himself to empower you to live for his glory. See, he's calling men and women to himself, but he's doing it through you. This treasure is in earthen vessels. Learn how to hold that tension, ladies and gentlemen. Why did God save you? To use you to save others. All right, sub point B in our outline. Not only are we considering the light of the gospel as, as Paul puts it, let me, let me say another couple things about that before I get to the prophecy and tie Isaiah 60 into our text. When I talk to you about the, the light of the gospel, and you, you know experientially it has happened sometime in your life, you know, God and his mercy came to you through the gospel, didn't he? Like, for many years, you may have heard it if you've grown up in church, like a lot of people have, the gospel went way over your head. The reason why is you're not saved by your own will or by your own power. You're only saved when it's God time to bring you out of your darkness. And often what God will do is he'll let you live in your mess long enough to help you get tired of it. That'll come home in a second. He'll let you live in your mess long enough to get tired of your mess. And then he say, you ready? <laughs> you ready? I know he did it for me. I'm just saying, I, I know he did it for me. And I ran from him for a long time. I rebelled because it's in your nature to rebel. But you can't out-rebel God. God has all power. That's why we call salvation a sovereign work. He knows how to hunt you down because he ain't lost. He never was. You were lost. God wasn't lost. He knows how to hunt you down right where he meant for you to land. And then graciously change your heart and show you his mercy in Christ, and then take you by the hand and walk you away from where you used to be. Well, you know what we call that? We call that, we call that conversion. In other words, you know how you were just walking crazy? And then all of a sudden, you know, Lord, I'm done. That was grace working. That was grace picking you up, turning you around. Now you're being a little bit more careful about your life. All of a sudden, God means something to you. And now you're trying to find out where the Bible is being taught correctly. Isn't that true? Because you actually need to know more about this God who knew you before you knew him, knew where you would land, and then meet you there, pick you up, and bring you out of the pit of darkness. You had to learn that. May I say one more thing about it? One more thing. So you and I are on a journey. It's a process. Proverbs 4.18, I've taught it to you for a long time. So now that the light is shining in your heart, and you're on the road because we're all on the road, it's a process. The path of the just, that's you and me, justified freely by his grace in Christ. The path of the just is as a what? Shining light. So you, you on a path and God has cut the lights on. I love it, don't you? Yes, yeah, some days I do, some days I don't. A few of y'all know what I mean, right? Because see, we're still sinners, right? And what that means is sometimes I want to cut the lights off. I shouldn't stay here too long, but I'm going to just stay here for somebody that needs to be liberated. I think I said it last week, right? The Holy Ghost is walking with you. He is the light. And some days you want to walk in darkness. So you got to cut the dimmer switch down. I told you it's a dimmer switch, right? The dimmer switch. And you want him with you, but you don't want all that light. Oh, you don't want all that light. You, you just want enough light to be able to say, I thank God for saving me by his grace. There are a lot of you in the room just like that right now. All you want is this grace to save you, not change you, not correct you, not lead you. You don't want this grace to be Lord of your life. You don't like being told you're wrong. You just want to go to glory. Cut the dimmer switch down. But you know, do you think God would spend as much uh, collateral as he did in saving your raggedy soul to let you just do whatever you want to do? He gave his only begotten son. That's all that he had to redeem you from all iniquity. You know he going to be in your business. So we said it last week. You cut the dimmer switch down and the Holy Ghost goes over to the dimmer switch and cuts it back up. You cut it down. He goes and cuts it back up. Third time you act a fool and want to go over and cut it down. He stands by the dimmer switch. 
and he got another kind of switch. Because that's the way our father is, right? All whom the Lord loves, he does what? All right, which way you want it? <laughs> this switch or this switch, right? We'll be dealing with that in Hebrews 12, week after next. You just need to know he disciplines his children. This helps you know how he loves you because a lot of us don't want God to love us the way God loves us. We don't want to be corrected. We don't want to be warned. We don't want to be threatened. We don't want to be told you need to wake up. I hear it all the time from the saints. You don't want to be told. God's talking to you. I don't want to hear from God. I only want him to say what I want him to say. God's going to say what he wants to say, and especially to you who he has bought. Even if he doesn't talk to the rest of it. Can you imagine that child of God? God's not talking to anybody else on the planet but you. <laughs> he didn't let everybody else just chill, and he talking to you because he cares. Because he cares. So we're on a journey of growth. You, you are wiser than you were a year ago, I hope. You are more sensitive to the value systems of the kingdom than you were five years ago, I hope. You have been humbled enough in your walk with God to know more about your own obstiparous, cantankerous, rebellious ways than before, I hope. The reason I say that is because to the degree that you, are no, you know what kind of rebel you are, you're walking in light. And that's what light is designed to do. Let you see you for you so you can become honest with God. Am I making some sense? And you discover that when you're honest with God, he never upbraids you. Not when you're honest. He's just going to give you the resources to get it right. That's the prodigal son, is it not? And so with the child of God, the only reason it becomes difficult with God is because you want to deal with God as a transgressor and not a child. And the ways of a transgressor are what? They always are. You're still going to heaven, but the road going to be bumpy. Now, why do you want to be going down a road with all kind of potholes and your car bobbling pop and, and everybody else walking smooth? They're walking smooth. Yours got all kind of potholes. Now, you're on the same road, but you're choosing to go on the left side of the road instead of the right. No pun intended. Now, he's going to get you there, but it's going to be hard. And see... No one wants to ride with you because they see your hoopty bumping all up. Ain't nobody rolling with you. They rather walk. They see that brother say, he having a hard time. I think I'll walk. Now, your job is to actually attract men and women. That's what light is designed to do. This is what I love about God. God is light. Do you know what that means? He wants company. You cut the lights on to have people over. You, you cut the lights on to have people over. And you behave in a certain way to attract people. This is what it means to be a witness. We draw men and women by our light and by our conduct. Am I making some sense? Right now, you might get a couple of dysfunctional people that don't mind riding around with you in your hoopty, running over the pothole. They just, man, I just need a ride. I jump in. I just need a ride. They're not listening to you at all. they just holding on for the ride. Because you, 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 you. <laughs> Am I painting the picture all right? Right, and the point, the point that I want us to get as we move over into the deeper language of Revelation chapter 21 is that where we are going is where we already are. And the, and the sooner we think more comprehensively that way, the sooner we will make the kind of adjustments where the grace of God is at our availability to have a smoother ride and a more productive ride in terms of men and women who need a ride. Because men and women need a ride to glory. They need a ride. And you are the vehicle for that ride. That's what our text is teaching. Now, what I want to quickly say, because we do expository teaching here under sub point B, the prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled. You will notice in Revelation chapter 21, verse 25 and 26, language you heard explicitly in Isaiah 60. How many of you guys picked up on that? Five of y'all. Okay, here we go. Um, this is why I got to do a lot of Bible teaching at Grace. Now, this is supposed to be a Bible teaching church and five people out of 200 people raise their hand. All right. I'm wondering how many people raise their hand outside among the 50 out there. Did y'all raise your hands? This is why you got to read your Bible, because what we have learned is the Old Testament foreshadows the new. The New Testament fulfills the old. 
and you cannot understand the old without the new. What I said to you earlier is in Isaiah 60, you have language that looks like millennial language that many are asserting will only be fulfilled by the Jewish centered theology in the millennium. And yet John is taking you and me into eternity with it, has he not? He didn't skip over a whole millennial thing because what I've shared with you before, the millennium started with Jesus. Jesus is the millennium. And every believer in Jesus is a millennial child. You can hold on to that and think that through. Go back to Revelation chapter 20, read verse 1 all the way through verse 9, and you'll discover that all of the in indicators in that text describes you. You've been raised from the dead. You are seated in heavenly places. You rule with Christ. You are a king. You are a priest. Is that not true? These are all they that are partakers of the first resurrection. You've escaped the second death, have you not? Did not Jesus put away our sins by the sacrifice of himself? Did not Paul say there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus? Didn't Jesus make it plain? Verily, verily, he that believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life and will never come into condemnation or judgment because he has passed from death to life. Now, if Jesus said that, you're good to go. Is that true? You're good to go. Now, what he wants you to know is as you go, learn about what it is that he did for you. You don't want to be an ignorant Christian. You can't help anybody if you're walking in darkness because ignorance is a synonym of darkness. That's going to be our last point in a moment. You're a child of God. You're supposed to be a child of knowledge to help people on their way. You can't help them if you're in darkness too. Notice what it says in verse 25. And let me start at verse 24 through verse 26. Notice what it says. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. That is the light of the lamb and light of the father, right? In the light of the lamb and light of the father. Will you notice what's going on here? The nations are drawn to God because of the light of Christ and the light of God. Is that what the text is indicating? Watch it. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. What does that mean? They experience the saving knowledge of God as described by Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. For God hath commanded the light to shine in our hearts, right? Shining out of darkness. This is the nations. They are walking in the light of it. And notice, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor to it. Now, who are they bringing their glory and honor to, according to Revelation 21? The Lamb and the Father. Well, that makes sense. I just told you, you and I are living between grace and glory. Is that right? We are simultaneously what? Sinful and what? Righteous, right? And because we're on that journey, we get to taste the future in the present. Do you remember what happened at the birth of our king? How the Gentiles came from afar? And what did they bring? Gold and silver and frankincense and myrrh. Do you see it right there? What we teach is that Jesus is the beginning and end of the millennium for people who think well. Your Bible explicitly lays it out. Look at it. And the nations and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor. I'm getting ready to make that even more clear. Look at verse 25 of our text. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no what? We just read that in Isaiah. Going back then, because I want you to see the language, I want to explain it. Isaiah chapter 60, I'm going to start at verse 3. I want to read verse 9 and then 11 and 12 to show you what I'm saying. Isaiah 63, and the Gentiles shall come to your light. Now stop right there. Who are the Gentiles? That's me. Now I might have some Hebrew in me, I don't know, but I'm going to go way back to find out if I got some Hebrew blood. What I do know is I'm a Gentile. And I also know this, I have come to his light. How many of you Gentiles have come to his light? That text is being fulfilled for every sinner that comes to know the light. Now may I ask you a question? Who is that light? That's what we just learned, didn't we? John chapter 1, you'll see it again in 1 John chapter 1. He's the light. And the kings do, the kings to the brightness of his rising. Now mark that. The kings that we just read in Revelation chapter 21, there they are again. Can I help you with the language? The brightness of his rising refers to the power and efficacy of his resurrection. Did y'all get that? He rose again from the dead. Did he rise again from the dead? That's why he said in John chapter 12, verse 30, 
If I be lifted up, verse 32, I will do what? Draw all men unto me. It's the brightness of his rising that draws us to him. It's the brightness of his rising. You and I are only raised from the dead because he was raised from the dead. It's important to see what I am doing with Isaiah 60 verse 3, which some of my uh, theological brethren uh, are going torturous over right now, is I'm showing you the Christocentric fulfillment. I'm helping you see Jesus in the text, am I not? Because if you take the New Testament and remove all of its information away from Isaiah 60, guess what it appears to be talking about? National Israel. It appears to be talking about a physical Jerusalem. It appears to be talking about a physical temple, does it not? But all of a sudden, when you put the light of the New Testament on it, whoa, nobody's saved by bowing down to a piece of real estate. No one's saved by bowing down to another sinner, be it Jew or Gentile. We're only saved by the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Do you see the excellency of the New Testament bringing light to the Old Testament? Do you all see it? Because that's my job as the instrument of God to help you see the gospel in the Old Testament. So you can be freed up from the Old Testament limitations that would take you back to legalism and works religion. You don't want that. You want the freedom. That's, that's why John said, stop looking at temples. That's why he says, God is the true light. And Jesus came the first time to help men and women understand that. When he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father but by me, he put an end of all of that stuff back in A.D. 30. Did he not? So men and women, I've told you this before, in that early period of the Old Testament, because Jesus lived out the Old Testament. So when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're reading Old Testament. But guess what Jesus was doing? He was functioning in New Testament principles. He was calling men and women to himself before the temple was even destroyed, before the veil was rent, before the ministry of the high priest was done with. What was he doing? Calling men and women to himself. Now, if he really believed that there was efficacy in the temple, he would have told them to go to the temple. Isn't that right? If he really believed that salvation was by the works of the law, would he not have said, do everything that Moses says, whatever the priest should say, do. But to call men and women to himself is to say that he was greater than the temple, that he was greater than the priesthood, that he was greater than Moses. And he was. Because he knew he had come to fulfill everything that Moses and the temple and the priesthood signified. Are y'all tracking with me? And how beautiful is God to send his son in the flesh to give us the blessing of New Testament salvation even before he died for us. He got to be bad. Doesn't he have to be bad? Doesn't he have to be bad to give you a heaven-like grace? He told the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise. You got to be bad to believe in a God that can save you on the merits of something he's going to get done in the future. And what I'm helping you understand as we go through the book of the Revelation is to enjoy the fact that the book of the Revelation is teaching both future and present. All right, look with me at verse, uh, verse 9. Look at verse 9. Surely the isle shall wait for thee. Now, I want you to mark the language. Y'all in school now. I got 20 minutes with you. I want you to mark language. I know you get the heebie-jeebies when you got to be educated, but just track with me. Surely the isles. What are the isles in the Bible? The Gentiles. Why? Because islands, islands represent the nations that are far away from Palestine. You and I are the isles. Am I making sense? Surely the isles shall wait for thee. Now watch how this language works in, to, in terms of its construction. Who's talking here? It's the Holy Spirit through the Father talking about the nations waiting on who? Jesus. Can y'all see that? Surely the isles shall wait for who? Sorry, Jesus is here talking. Christ is saying they're waiting on who? On me, on me. And the ships of Tarshish first to bring your sons from far, their silver and their gold with them unto the name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel. The name of the Lord thy God and to the Holy One of Israel is a subscription of the Father and the Son. It always is. Our Holy God and the Holy One of Israel. Who is the Holy One of Israel if it's not Christ? Now watch what it says, because he, who is the he here? Jesus hath glorified thee. Who is the thee there? God the Father. Y'all got that? 
Christ came to glorify the Father, and in glorifying the Father, he draws sinners from every nation, kindred, tribe, and tongue. Is that making sense, child of God? Now watch this now. Over in verse 10, I'm gonna, I want to go through verse 12. And the sons of strangers shall build thy walls, and the king shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor I have had mercy on thee. Now you have a choice to look at this with an Old Testament lens or a New Testament lens. You can view this as the temporal judgment that was placed on natural, national Israel because they broke Torah. Or you can see Jesus hanging on the cross, bearing the sins of his people, where God smote him for a little while and then showed him the mercies of David, the sure mercies of David that was given to him in Revelation chapter 2. Are you guys hearing me? I would assert to you that the latter is the interpretations. The king shall minister to you because in my wrath I smote thee, but in my favor I have hid, I have had mercy on thee. If you look at the language, the father is saying, because you have bore the sins of your people and you have risen again, you will draw kings unto you. I love this. See, so now you may not know this, but from the day that Jesus rose again from the dead up to this present time, nations have been converted unto him. Whole nations. Kings and rulers have bowed the knee to Jesus Christ and their whole tribes and their whole countries and their whole nations have come up under the light of the gospel. Am I making some sense? This is what I love about my, our country, Africa. Africa is schizophrenic in a lot of ways. Y'all know that. Y'all know that, right? But we still love them because they were one of the early nations that actually received the gospel. The Ethiopian eunuch, Queen Candace, even going back to King Solomon with the Queen of Sheba. So black folk got the gospel early on. I've taught you that, right? This is Augustine. This is Athanasius. This is Irenaeus. I can tell you how all that works. The point being, listen to me now, the point being is that Jesus knew he was going to save people from all these countries. I'm talking to my uh, Iranian brethren right here, and we know that the gospel came to the Iranians. It came to them in the Persian Empire, and it stayed. And even now, as we're dealing with some of these crazy political issues over there, please pray for the believers in those countries. Don't get wrapped up in political titles. Many of the saints are still there. Many true believers are still there having to deal with this foolishness that has come out of Washington. All right, it's another thing because at a higher level, God is doing something and chastising us, but please get it. Verse 11 and 12, I want you to capture this. Isaiah 60, verse 11. Therefore, your gate shall be open. Isn't that what we read in Revelation chapter 21? Your gates shall be open. Watch this. They shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles and that their kings may be brought there. Didn't we just read in Revelation 21, the kings of the nation shall come unto thee? Didn't we just read the gates will not be shut? I'm showing you how the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. That's why your sub point is very clear. The prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled. I want you to look now at verse 12. And then I got one more verse I want you to see. For the nations and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall what? For the nation and the kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Does that sound like national Israel is some kind of monarchical sovereign over the rest of the people of the world? Or does it sound like Jesus is the king of Zion to whom everyone must bow the knee? The latter is true, is it not? You see how necessary your eyes are to open up? from buying into an Old Testament motif? Raise your hand if you understand what I just stated. No, this is important, please get it, please get this. When Jesus said, lo, I come, and the volume of the book is written of me, we gotta know it's written of him. You gotta know that. If you hold to an Old Testament lens, you can never see Jesus. He came to save us. Israel can't save you. Palestine can't save you. The priesthood can't save you. The temple can't save you. Judaism can't save you. Christianity can't save you. Only the king of glory can save you. Now, I want you to hear the verse. I want you to hear the verse because I already know it. You should know it too. It's Psalm 2 verse 12. Kiss the sun. See, now that's a term where peasants bow down to monarchs. I'm a peasant, but I'm God's peasant. How about you? I don't mind kissing the feet of Jesus. 
I don't mind kissing the feet of Christ. And here's what it says. Kiss the son, lest he be angry with you and you perish out of the way. Now I'm going to make a point of this as we get to our last point. I'm going to make a point of it because what I know is a lot of us do not view Jesus as a king. And this is why we don't walk with the authority of an ambassador. I'm going to say it again. A lot of us don't view Jesus as a king and therefore we don't walk with the authority of an ambassador. Because we don't see Jesus as king, we don't think we have the authority of the king to let men and women know they're under the wrath of God. Because we don't view Jesus as a king, we don't have the intuitive fortitude to know as an ambassador, we can tell magistrates, we can tell leaders, we can tell governors that King Jesus is Lord of Lords and King of Kings and everyone must bow to him. Because we don't walk in the ambassadorship, of Jesus being king of our life, we don't have the comfort of telling our local magistrates, I am not doing that because I am a child of the living God. I am not doing that because I've been brought with a price. I don't get to do whatever I want to with my body. The blood of Jesus Christ has purchased it. He is the king of my life. And he told me to tell you he's the king of your life too. So now I'm working for you in this institution, but I'm here to tell you, you can't force me against my conscience to do anything now that I know that Jesus is my king. You can't do it. But here we go with this American Christianity, which is really ticking me off. Because it's hyper-personal and it's completely alien to the New Testament. And once you do that, you have no authority. You have no authority. You, have, you and I have no authority if we don't see Jesus as king. And every pagan country understands the implications of Christianity. Do you know that? Do you, do you know all the communist countries? And they're all communists. Whether you know it or not, they're all communists. Do you know all these communist countries? No. We've got to get rid of the Christian because their worldview is that there's a God and an authority greater than them. That means they cannot ultimately submit to us. Do you guys understand that? Here's what God has to do with a bunch of us weak Christians. You know what he has to do? He has to raise Islam up to hold to that Old Testament paradigm of, of Yahweh as being Lord. And then being more vigorous to fight for the lordship of, 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 uh, of Allah than for us as Christians of Christ. Did y'all hear what I just stated? Well, now we know they're way off in their theology and they're trapped by an Old Testament perversion of the system. We know that. But when you see them say, no, God, but Allah, Christians say, no, God, but Yahweh through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. You ain't going to do it. You're not going to do it because you don't want to pay the price. You don't want to pay the price. Now, this is alien. This is not biblical Christianity. All of our brothers and sisters around the world in all humility are suffering because they will not bow the knee to communism. They will not bow the knee to China. They will not bow the knee to, um, to, um, to Pakistan or Afghanistan or even in Iran. They won't bow the knee. Now, they're, they're dealing with all kind of uh, strategic methods of, kind to, of avoiding the target on their back, but they won't bow the knee. And see, we're starting to feel the heat here and we're getting all discombobulated. Am I making some sense? People getting upset with me because I keep blowing the trumpet. I got to blow the trumpet. You got to wake up. What makes you think we're not going to have persecution here? What makes you think you don't have to take a hit for Jesus here? I got to wake you up. Remember what I said in the earlier part of the message? I got 10 more minutes. You know what, you know what I said? Don't go to sleep. I said, don't go to sleep. Because Christians want to go to sleep because they've been being sleep for the last 40, 50 years. The, the enemy has just stroked y'all on y'all back. Y'all been doing breast strokes and back strokes in the warm waters of slothfulness for many decades. Now you don't want to hear the trumpet when it warns you to wake up. When it warns you to take a stand for the gospel. You don't want to hear it. You want us to do what Isaiah chapter 30 says. You remember what he says? Prophesy, prophesy not unto us. Give us smooth things. Tell us what we like. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from among us. The moment I do that, somebody needs to shoot me. 
Do you understand what I just said? Because I have betrayed your God. The moment I simply start catering to your whimpering, I have betrayed your God. Have I not? It's important for you to know. If you're going to say that God died for you and he secured your eternity, can't you lose a job? And I told you on Friday, all you're doing is having an opportunity to share the gospel. All you're doing is having an opportunity to share the gospel. That's all. Which you know we don't like to do. But we're Christian. We got our light head. I bet your arm hurting so hard trying to keep that light head. It's trying to come out. And you keep putting it. And now God in his providence is, is, is forcing you to say, hey, look. The Lord Jesus bought me with a price. His body, my body is his body. And he's telling me I should not do something that actually goes against my conscience. And so for some of you, you already did it. Don't, don't be upset with us who haven't done it. We love you. We love you. And if you get informed, you can tell others, hey, you better think this through. You better think it through. We love you. We don't hate you. We love you. There are dark days coming. Child of God, there are dark days here. Do you understand that? Dark days. And it's time, we talked about this a decade ago. You know what we talked about? Grown folk Christianity. How many of you guys remember when I started talking about what it means to be a grown-up Christian? It's time to be a grown-up Christian now. Time to be a grown-up Christian. What John does here is give a play on what is called time and eternity. What will be as the final state is already occurring in this present gospel age now. We've talked about this already, but not yet. It's very important for you to understand that's what you're looking at in your text. And now let's get back to this concept of the light. When John says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 23, and the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, uh, to shine in it for the glory of God did lighten it and the lamb is the light thereof guess what he has done saints he's taken us all the way back to Genesis do you remember it in Genesis chapter uh, 1 verse 1 in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth y'all got to put it up there on the screen because people don't read their Bibles in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth verse 2 and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and what do we get in verse 3 God said what did he say that now please listen to what's going on here God didn't say let me have a big old hot ball of, of energy to be thrown up in the midst of the hemisphere let me have a sun and a moon and stars he said let there be light and immediately there was light he's describing a supernatural light that operated at the beginning of creation that was not taking place till several verses later when he gave timekeepers the sun moon and stars am i making sense would you agree with me that this light here is his son jesus christ i am the light of the world if any man follow me, he will never walk in darkness. Do you guys see that? So what we're dealing with in Revelation 21 is what I told you before. We're headed back to Eden. We're headed back to the reversal of the curse before the curse into that Edenic state of joyful perfection and fellowship with God, the Father, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. He is the light of the world. Am I making some sense? Do you see it? All right, so I got one more verse to deal with, and it's going to deal with the darkness that I've just been talking to you about. So you know what God does in his Bible, uh, notwithstanding people that love to complain about it, he warns us frequently. Like, you don't go through your Bible much without getting the warning. Is that right? Like, if you're really going to keep up with God, you know what he's going to do every now and tell you? There's a speed bump ahead. Slow down. That's just what God does, because he cares. Notice what our, uh, Revelation chapter 21, verse 27 says, and I want to walk through that for the next 10 minutes. I'm done, maybe even less than that. Mark what it says in Revelation 21, verse 27. After verse 26, and they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Verse 27 says, and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth. Do you see? Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written where? Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to capture this because you already know it in the summation of that terminology. If you're not a Bible reader, you don't get this. 
And there shall in no wise enter into the new Jerusalem, the holy Jerusalem, the city of God, the eternal city of God. Nothing that does not correspond with the gospel will enter into it. Nothing that did not submit to God's truth will enter into it. What this language is saying is no idolater will make it into the kingdom of God. Are you guys with me? I want to anchor this down. I want you to get this because it's a specific people group he's talking about in the book of Revelation. And that specific people group, we want to see some correlation of where you and I are presently. I think it's important when God tells you and me about all that we get in the new heavens and the new earth and then tell us, but it will never ever be that an individual who worships a false god or bows down to an idol that is not God will accidentally show up in God's glory. Now, this becomes one of the offenses of the gospel. Because now once we go around telling men and women that Jesus is the only way, truth, and life, what we're saying is the imaginary gods of your own mind will never get you into glory. What we are saying to men and women is if you seek to fabricate your own works righteousness, you, you're going to come to God with your good works. You're going to come to God. And in fact, you're not even coming to the true and the living God. According to this language, you are fabricating another God. Or you are bowing down to another God who is demanding you to fabricate other false gods. Now, that's exactly what Revelation chapter 13, verse 13 through 15 asserted. Because if you really pay attention to the language of the book of Revelation, God has a serious problem with all those who had submitted to the uh, to the uh, rhetoric and the threats of the beast kingdom in Revelation 13. You remember there were two beasts, political and religious, right? We are in Revelation 13, verse 13, please. I want to show you that what God says all the way up past the final judgment is that if men and women bow to the beast... If they bow to the beast, if they receive the mark of the beast, the number of the beast, the name of the beast, and the evidence of it is, is you replicate that beast. You actually create, you actually replicate the idol system of that beast, because that's what it teaches. Watch this. Revelation 13, 13. And he doeth great wonders. Who is this? This is that beast that had horns like a lamb, but spoke like a dragon. You guys remember that? That means he looks religious. But actually, he is of the same evil, maniacal, demonic power of the political beast in Revelation chapter uh, 12, right? Or Revelation 13. That means politics and religion has come together. Y'all remember that? Whenever politics and religion comes together, this is why. Listen, listen. Whenever you hear Christians sounding just like the state, warn them. Warn them. Warn them. Believers don't ever have a right to simply echo what politicians say. You don't ever have a right. Listen to me. Just listen very carefully. Listen, listen. I know you might be persuaded by them. I know you just think they're right. I know you obviously believe that they won't harm you. You have no history to actually prove that all the history says otherwise. And I know it's a lot of hard work. I know it's a lot of hard work to ha have to listen to a politician open his mouth and utter phrases. And then you got to go back and determine whether those phrases correspond with reality or not. I know that's hard. I know it's hard for you to believe that your government actually doesn't have your best interest in view. I know that's hard. I know it's hard. I know it's I, they couldn't possibly, Pastor Jesse, be so mean and so maniacal as to want to actually bring us into bondage. Only that's what every other nation in the world has done from the beginning of time. And this is why we love the book of the Revelation is because it pulls no punches. It tells you exactly what every church age will go through. We're not the only church age going through this. Every church age has gone through the period where the gospel has penetrated that culture. And we lived a peaceful life for a long time, even in a polytheistic construct. And then over time, the powers of the evil system. Remember, the devil operates out of principalities and powers in high places. Eventually, the government becomes tyrannical and it starts bringing people into subjugation. And largely, Christians oppose it. And then the government has to set up policies and strategies to uh, persecute that Christian. Am I making sense? 
and it will do it with every other kind of religion that does not acknowledge the state as God. And what I, what I, what keeps me fit to be tied is when Christians talk like the state is God. This is what I mean by you not operating out of an understanding of the monarchical authority of Christ in your life. Monarchical meaning kingship. When you don't operate as if Christ is king in your life, then somebody is an authority in your life. Someone is the one out of whom and from whom you are actually replicating their words. Now here's the image, here is the language, here's what it's saying. And he doeth wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. Did I not teach you that the goal of the enemy is to make you think he's God? And that the Old Testament motif of the one true and living God is that he rains fire down from heaven? Didn't I teach you that? That Elijah said, whoever the true and living God is, let him rain fire down. And in these last days, what we are learning is that the enemy is able to bring lying signs and wonders to deceive, even if it's possible, the very elect. Have I not told you that? Has Christ not told you that? Have you not been told that it's not going to be easy to filter through and interpret and deconstruct all of the politics, all of the narratives? Have you not been told that? Why then are you like weary when the trumpet is being blown to let you know, wake up? Why are you being weary? Now, now you can easily prove me wrong. Just go get the data and prove me wrong. Otherwise, you know what? Maybe God's talking to me. Maybe God's talking to me. Okay? So listen to the language. He doeth great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. His job is to deceive humanity. Verse 14. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth. We talked about that. We got the two categories in the book of Revelation. Two categories. Earth dwellers and heaven dwellers. Didn't I tell you we are already where we are going? Are you in heavenly places in Christ, child of God? Do you sit with Jesus? Do you have a bird, bird's eye view on the world because you have the Holy Ghost? Right. So the heavens get to rejoice. If you go back to chapter 12, rejoice ye heavens, but woe unto the inhabitants of the earth because the devil has come down with great wrath because he knows he has a sharp period of time. This is that same devil. Notice what the language says. And he deceives them on the earth by means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth. Now, are you an earth dweller? Say no. no. Okay, good. You can say no. What that means is you ain't got to pay no attention to the devil. Because he only talking to earth dwellers. Did y'all get what I just said? He talking to earth dwellers. He ain't talking to me. He's not talking to me. I get my, I get my marching orders from heaven. I get my marching orders from heaven. I get my marching orders from the king of glory. See, I hear him, but he has no authority over me. Now watch this. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image. That's what God hates. That's what God hates. That they should make an image of the beast which had the womb by the sword and did live. Now, I'm not going to unpack that any more than I shared it with you about a year ago when we were in chapter 13. The political kingdom seemed like it was going to die and then it rose up again. And everybody said, whoa, he's like a savior. And now everybody is bowing to the government. And then religion is coming along and saying the government can save you. And then religion is telling you to take it. I'll give you a perfect example, the Pope. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Catholicism. I have a great deal of knowledge of Catholicism. Catholicism is falling apart from the inside. And rightly so. Its foundation is rotten. And the Pope they have now is as far from any kind of Catholic credo truth you could even imagine. And he's telling everybody to just take it. Do you see the parallels? See, I'm going to use the Catholic Church so y'all won't be upset with me. So, we, you know, we like to talk bad about the Catholic Church. <laughs> yeah, they bad. They're apostate. They're this. They're that. But think about it. This representative head of the Catholic Church is saying to everybody, Catholics knows that he has violated cardinal doctrine. 
They know he has. They know that the standard doctrine of the church is that the Catholic is not to actually aid in a bet in anything that brings harm or has used anything of a fetal nature. That is a baby's. I've already given you the affidavit. Seems a faithful Catholic is going to stand on Catholic doctrine and suffer for Catholic doctrine. Even though their pope, which is no pope at all, which most of the archbishops call the Antichrist. I don't blame them. But see, that's the fighting that's going on in Catholicism. Are you guys hearing me? It's beautiful because you are. I know several of the bishops and the fathers that are actually fighting the good fight of faith to expose this thing. Doing a great job. I know very few evangelical Protestant pastors that are doing it. Very few. Very few. I wouldn't tell you to go back to the Catholic Church any more than I would tell you to step right on into hell right now because the doctrine is so bad, particularly at the heart of soteriology. It does not preach free sovereign grace. Did you guys hear what I just stated? It does not preach free sovereign grace. Now, God may have mercy on, on many of the ignorant Catholics, but I'd rather know where I'm going than to just kind of ignorantly stumble into glory. Am I making some sense? Give me a few more minutes. I'm done. My point is, if you read your Bible carefully from Revelation 13 to Revelation 21, God is repeatedly saying, I have no tolerance for men and women who bow down to the courts, bow down to the state, bow down to false religion, who are saying the same thing and not recognizing me as sovereign Lord. Those are the people of whom Revelation 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19 are saying the wrath of God is poured out upon them without mixture in his indignation. Now, I want you to get this as I close. It's very important for you to get. We're not out of the woods of men and women who think they're Christians right now, even in this place, one day discovering they are completely under the authority of the state and under apostate Christianity and just simply doing whatever the government says. You and I are not out of the clear. I hope you understand that. This is the paradigm of what happened with Jesus at the cross. Do you know this? All kind of people followed Jesus first year. All kind of people followed him second year. Third year, he started telling people, I'm headed to Calvary. I'm not headed to Jerusalem to take over. I'm going to die. All kind of people fell off. As he got even closer, guess what? The disciples, they had some distance. They let him walk a little bit ahead. And they started whispering. Now, what did he say? Now, they were with him for three and a half years. This is called cognitive dissonance. Please help me. You've been told by your master for three and a half years you're going to Calvary. And you're going, now, what did he say? This is called a bias against clarity in your own mind. This is cognitive dissonance. Y'all understand that? When you really don't want to hear what you're supposed to have heard the first time. What? What? Go, go to the cross. He's been saying that ever since he called you knucklehead. We're not going to some prosperity. We're not going to some prominence. We're not going to triumph and rule over the world. We're not going to be the top, the head, and they be the bottom. Right now, we're walking in what is called a humility paradigm. It's a lamb's life. It's a lamb's life. And Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you got to be ready to live a lamb's life. Is everybody in this assembly understanding what I just stated? Please understand what I'm saying. This is why I've been carefully going through the studies I have about what it means to walk in the spirit in order that you might mortify the deeds of the flesh. I'm really trying to help you stop being afraid of the government and to actually do your diligence to find out what's right and what's wrong. Your conscience is only free to make a choice when you are fully informed. Did you hear what I just stated? And don't let people trick you into thinking it's all right. Because I hear very lazy thinking among you Christians. I hear very lazy thinking. Oh, I'm, I'm just going to do it because, you know, I, I just, I'm just going to do it. And I'll just let whatever consequences come. That's not Christian thinking. That is not Christian thinking. Did you understand what I just stated? Christian thinking is prove all things hold fast to that which is good. Christian thinking is being circumspect because your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Christian thinking is the prudent looks well to his going while the gullible person just walks right on ahead and falls in the trap. Christian thinking is 
You test the spirits whether they are of God or not. Because every spirit that says that he's of God is not of God. Christian thinking is actually working through every policy, every argument, every proposition that comes your way, and you examine it in light of the scripture, and then you make a determination around good counsel. Watch this. Good counsel is not just you and your Bible. You know, I read my Bible, I flipped it open, and it turned over into uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and 1 Peter chapter 2 said, just do whatever your government says. No, that's not how you get good counsel. That's not how you get good counsel. You get good counsel by praying, reading your Bible, and then finding wise men and women who have proven to be faithful in exegeting the word of God and living out the gospel to give you advice so that you can make an advised decision. That's how you live the Christian life. Like, actually, you, you probably don't know it. The reason you and I are as free as we are right now, I'm going to stop right here. I just want you to get this. Because I, I know we don't know. We don't study enough. We don't study church history. Do you know the freedom you have to argue with me and argue with God and argue with scripture came from other Christians who were being persecuted in other countries who came to America in order to have the freedom of religion. Your freedom to argue with me came from Christians who were persecuted in other countries. I can name many of them. I'm from the reformed community. We know what they did. They came to America because of persecution because they wanted freedom to worship God. And they heard that we have a constitution that honors freedom of religion, which it doesn't today. And they suffered that their children might be able to have a country wherein they could grow up under the gospel. You are the inheritors of men and women that were willing to leave their own home country and travel thousands of miles for freedom in order that you and I might be the beneficiaries of their suffering. Raise your hand if you understand what I just stated. Now, I, I just want to make this point come home because I know we're guilty. We're guilty. We're guilty of not knowing what we should know. We're guilty. And it's wrong. We are in a very auspicious state in America with the kind of laws we have and, 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 uh, and, and structure, even culturally. We can push back in a civil way and it will work because it was set up to work that way. It was set up that if you just push back, they wake up to the reality that you're protected by law. Did you hear what I just stated? You don't get that in countries around the world. And you're going to sit on your lazy tail and not do the hard work of being a Christian when the forefathers have laid a foundation for you to be a Christian. We got a great opportunity here. We have a great opportunity. Do you understand what I just say to say? You have a great opportunity to love everybody, to love all mankind, and to love them by loving your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And they're simply saying, hey, as a Christian, I don't just get to do whatever I want to do. And then if you're a little bit bodacious, like your pastor and a few others of us, you get to go, and you don't either, because he bought you too. God owns you too. And maybe that'll be a culture to help them to come to realize they need redemption too. Amen.